so good to see you all. We have 169 participants, so, so glad to have people uh, joining us. I want to share with you a brief reflection, and then I'll, um, I'll be back again to share um, a, another part of that reflection later. Last Sunday, uh, many of you were here when we hosted, uh, over 200 of you total, when we hosted Bonte, who, uh, the Buddhist monk, who has, Bonte Sujata, who's been here, this is his 10th year. Uh, this year, his Dharma talk that some of you may remember was titled, Suffering is Optional. Suffering is Optional. A week later, our world has shifted due to increased restrictions related to the coronavirus. And I'd like us to reflect a little bit more on that wisdom that Bhante shared with us from the Buddhist tradition. How might it continue to be a source of guidance for us, even as the world has changed? In the midst of a pandemic, what does it mean to say that suffering is optional? I'll start with a story. Some of you may have heard this before. Uh, it's from the meditation teacher, Sharon Salzberg. It's from a time she was co-leading a retreat with the meditation teacher, Go Joseph Goldstein. And a student came to them in the middle of this retreat. Everyone was supposed to be off meditating by themselves and came rushing up to them, filled with anxiety. And the man said, I just had a terrible, terrible experience meditating. I felt this tension in my jaw, and suddenly I realized I'm an incredibly uptight person. I can't get close to everyone. I am going to be alone for the rest of my life. Joseph heard him. He took a deep breath in and out, and he said, I hear that you had some tension in your jaw. But the man plowed forward and said, I am pretty sure I am always going to be tense. I am never going to change. I feel hopeless. And Joseph took another deep breath. So I hear you saying that you felt some tension in your jaw. The man continued barreling down the path of misery for some time, all because of his sore jaw, until Joseph finally interrupted him and said, you are having a painful experience of feeling tension in your jaw. Why are you adding to that this horrible story about yourself? I'll say that last part again. You're having a painful experience already. You're noticing tension in your jaw. Why are you choosing to add on to that this terrible story about yourself? This experience parallels an ancient Buddhist teaching called the Aero Sutta which says that when hit with discomfort, we feel two afflictions, the inevitable physical feelings uh, and additional mental reactions. For instance, if I accidentally hit my elbow on the side of the pulpit, there would be inevitable physical pain. But there might also be additional mental reactions of putting myself down, you know, beating myself up for, for, for doing that, uh, calling myself names. That, that second part is what I, what you, what we have more control over. The Arrow Sutta invites us to imagine these two afflictions as two arrows, like bow and arrows in a quiver. We can't do anything about that first arrow that hits us if we you know, accidentally do something or something we didn't ask for comes to us. Sometimes, despite our best efforts, we're hit with inevitable physical afflictions. But the Arrow Sutta challenges us that we can practice letting go of those additional arrows of mental reactions instead of continuing to shoot them into ourselves. This teaching is often summarized as pain is inevitable but suffering is optional. In the Buddhist tradition, that word suffering is from the Pali language. It's a word um, called dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A. A better English translation of suffering is unsatisfactoriness. So we might better say that physical pain is sometimes inevitable, but unsatisfactoriness is optional. Now, I'll readily confess that learning to stop shooting those second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth arrows sometimes into myself, that's easier said than done. As the meditation teacher Jack Cornfield has put it, we can sometimes be quite loyal to our suffering. Does that resonate with anybody? We can sometimes be quite loyal to our suffering. 
or we could translate it again as we are often quite loyal to keeping ourselves unsatisfied. It's not that we shouldn't change things that are negative and toxic, rather the invitation is to consider if we're sometimes making a bad situation even worse than it has to be. The good news is that learning different ways of being in the world, learning to grow spiritually, that's why we show up at UUCF week after week. That's why we show up, you know, even online, uh, you know, even when we can't be here in person. We come here to be reminded to practice loving kindness with our imperfections. We come here to practice being more tender, more spacious, more respectful uh, in relationship to ourselves, to one another, and to this world. Um, a, a loving kindness practice uh, that you can use is, you know, try even just putting, you can do this right now, try putting your hand on your heart or in your heart center and just notice any kind of suffering you're having right now and just say to yourself, just acknowledge it, this is a moment of suffering. This is a moment of unsatisfactoriness. And then acknowledge that unsatisfactoriness, suffering, that is part of the nature of existence. And then the third and final part is to set an intention, may I be kind with myself, with others, and this world amidst this unsatisfactoriness. Just pausing and doing that can really help. Just putting your hand on heart center and acknowledging this is a moment of suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Satis unsuffering and unsatisfactoriness, that is a part of life but may I be kind to myself and others and this world. Notice as well that I said to practice loving kindness with our imperfections. I'm not talking about doing all this so that we eventually reach some state of perfection. As you've heard me say before, quoting one of my colleagues, we are saved from perfection. There is no perfect that's going to work for you in all times and places. Some perfect that's going to work for all people in all times and places. Even experiencing what spiritual traditions speak of as enlightenment, that does not mean that you will be always perfect or pain-free. If you go back and read the teachings of the Buddha, who unlike you know, Jesus uh, lived to quite an old age. It writes about he had back pain. He had, you know, so like you, you see that being pain-free is not what we're talking about. It means experiencing greater liberation from optional suffering, from those additional arrows of mental reactions that we can sometimes shoot into ourselves. No matter what happens to us on our spiritual journey, impermanence and change will continue to happen to us all, enlightened or unenlightened. What changes is our relationship to what is happening to us. Awakening is about experiencing greater openness, greater freedom, greater equanimity to whatever is arising in our field of experience. In the words of Vince Horn, one of my meditation teachers, this, things like what is happening in the world right now, that's actually part of what we all who do engage in spiritual practices, that's what we've been practicing for. Uncertainty, suffering, birth, old age, sickness, and death, learning to work with these basic truths of life, learning to work with them with dignity, our UU first principle, learning to work with them with an open heart, with kindness, with compassion, that is what spiritual practices are ultimately all about. Now, I know that meditation isn't everyone's um, practice of choice, so even so, notice that there might be tools here in what I'm talking about that might be of use to you and or consider whatever practices you are drawn to. It could be cooking, art, yoga, exercise, science, whatever your jam. Uh, what might have parallel insights for you for such a time as this? Along these lines, I'm reminded of a quote from the Islamic Sufi mystic Hafiz. He used to say, fear. Fear is the cheapest room in the house, and I want to see you living in better conditions. So if you're finding yourself, it's not that you can't ever visit that fear room, but if you're just living in that fear place, I want you to have better conditions. Now, don't get me wrong, we should be appropriately afraid of this novel coronavirus, afraid for ourselves and or afraid especially for those who are particularly vulnerable. But what I'm cautioning against is being unduly afraid and anxious in ways that make the situation worse than it has to be, just keeping shooting those arrows of unsatisfactoriness into ourselves. To paraphrase a recent um, recommendation from Jack Cornfield, 
try addressing your anxieties and fears directly. Try speaking to them. Just say, you know, I'm noticing anxiety and fear arising. You know, thank you, anxiety and fear. I know that you are trying to protect me, but I'm okay right now. Tell them I'm okay right now. And then take a few moments, pause, notice, um, be grateful and savor uh, all the ways that statement is true for you right now and those closest to you, even if there are real problems. What are the ways that for you and for those you love, what is still okay in this present moment? Notice that and savor it. Don't forget that advice that we return to, I remind you about periodically from the Buddha's Brain, a uh, book by Rick Hansen, that our brains evolve to be like Teflon for good things and Velcro for bad things. So our brains, the whole fixating on bad things part, they're on it. They've got it covered. Our brains are super good, like Velcro, at latching on to bad things. What we need to practice and be intentional about in, for such a time as this is that uh, is is having them be uh, that noticing that they're Teflon for good experiences. So try to gently remind yourself. You can put a post-it note up on your bathroom mirror or whatever if you want to wash your hands, but also to intentionally savor all that remains good with you in such a time as this. All that remains good for those you love and in this world, even if just for a moment, be in the present as it actually is. As the Buddha said not reviving the past, not hoping for the future. Instead, with insight, see each arising state, not craving after past experience, nor setting one's heart on future ones, not bound up in desire or craving. Just this, just this moment as it actually is. And beyond what the world is already hitting you with, if you find yourself shooting those second and third or op more optional arrows into yourself, try gently asking yourself, is this thought serving me? There is great liberation in realizing that we don't have to believe everything we think. We don't have to believe everything we think. And although I can't tell you exactly what's coming uh, in the next days and weeks, I promise you, as with everything else, good or bad, this too shall pass. Again, in the words of the Buddha, whatever has the nature to arise has the nature to pass away. We can't stop the waves of change and impermanence from coming at us, but we can learn to better surf on those waves. And we don't have to figure it out alone. I'm so grateful to be together with all of you on this journey. I am grateful that we all have one another. It's a reminder that after the spoken meditation this morning, there will be a minute of silence. Earlier this week, I had cause to look up Rumi's poem, The Guest House. I looked it up for a reason that actually didn't have anything to do with our current pandemic. But as I read it again, I felt settled in heart and mind. Maybe you know this poem already, but please take a moment to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so and listen again, or for the first time. The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Right now, I feel like I'm being asked to share space with a lot of uninvited guests. Worry, isolation, the eternal temptation of scrolling to the next article and the next. And that's without even directly considering the uninvited guest of the moment, COVID-19. And that's without even considering all of the guests that Rumi names, the ones that show up and keep coming, whether we are sick or well, whether we are alone or together. 
When I think of the idea of a guide from beyond, what comes to mind for me is the way that the protective measures we're being asked to take are not for ourselves alone. On a grand global scale, we are invited to care for one another, to take care of those of us most at risk by limiting our exposure to one another. Perhaps we're cleaning out our houses literally, and perhaps we can take a moment to do it figuratively. Perhaps while we are home, giving space to our most vulnerable neighbors and the dedicated health professionals caring for those already ill, perhaps we can imagine a world together where we act in the interests of others. Perhaps we can welcome and entertain thoughts about a new world we can begin to glimpse, where public health makes us better neighbors, better friends, better humans. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. <laughs>